I worked probably for the per- first sort of 15 years um, as an activist, working as a trustee and fundraising and networking. And I then thought, what well, actually... So often when I was public speaking, everybody in the audience was the same as the last time I was public speaking. So I thought, actually, we've got to get out of this silo. So Mm -hmm. I started making films. Mm -hmm. So um, that's when I did um, Economics of Happiness in Bhutan and then um, Is Small Still Beautiful in India? And then I did Pig Business, but BBC World put the other two out, said, oh, no, I'm not going to put that one out because it was about a company. And defamation is very, very tricky to um, get through with a company suing potentially the publisher. So Channel 4 took it. And after um, a lot of wrangling where Smithfield Foods tried to sue Channel 4, in fact, right up to two hours before broadcast, they were being threatened with being sued. Um, Channel 4 did dare put it out, which was amazing. Can you wow. tell us what pig business is about? Yeah, pig business is about the corporate takeover of agriculture. But I focus on pigs because this particular story is how the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development gave a hundred million dollars loan, but a sweet loan to Smithfield Foods from America to come to Eastern Europe Poland before we joined the EU. So they could get a foothold in Europe, broke all. And then when they did join, they'd already got a grip in there and they could function as taking over all of the communist state farms. Um, But the Polish people were so unhappy with this company because local people were becoming sick. Because if you have these huge factory farms full of animals, the biodegrading feces omits hydrogen sulfide and ammonia, which makes local people, the ammonia affects their bronchi. So they were sore throats and running eyes and then the, um, ha- uh, the um, hydrogen sulfide makes them sick. And the workers were also sick. So the villages became very, very broken between those who had a job in this factory and those who said, no, we don't want this poison. And also it was poisoning the local rivers, so the fish were dying. So it had a huge impact. So um, the government started to make noises about being unhappy about Smithfield in their country. So Smithfield hedged their bets, as the CEO said, and went to Romania but the um, Minister for Agriculture in my film said, oh, poor Romania. They don't realize what they've got coming to them with this factory farm. So anyway, Smithfield Foods is now heavily established in Eastern Europe. And unfortunately, I'm hearing George Eustace saying that the vertically integrated farming system, which Smithfield has, is good for British farming. What does that mean, sorry, the vertically integrated Basically, when you talk about a corporate takeover, you have these massive processors with their label like Smithfield coming in and taking on the processing part and selling. So they don't really care what price they pay for the pigs because they make all their money on selling this, the actual pork. So they are doing these contracts with farmers who anyway in farming are going bankrupt as we speak because of cheap imports. So they say, okay, I'll give you a seven-year contract and you build the sheds, get them huge, and we'll put our pigs in there. Then come seven years, they say, well, I'm terribly sorry, but the price of pork's gone down. So we're not going to pay you what we said we'd pay you. So the farmer goes bankrupt because he's still got a huge debt for building the, the sheds. So that poor farmer is actually having to go and and sell his um, units to these giant processors. So the processors increasingly are owning the actual farms um, because they buy them up for dirt cheap. So this is not a way to keep farming going. My experience, not least from doing these films, because actually after Pig Business, I was asked to go to nine different countries People saying, oh, we're living by a factory farm, we're sick, where the water is depleting because it takes so much water, the um, fish are dying, our whole economy is, is being destroyed, or they're seeking planning permission, we've seen what's gone up, up the road, help us. Mm-hmm. So we'd go with our cameras and 
shove it in the face of um, the local authorities and support the local people. And actually, quite often, this would be a very to good tool, not only for getting the local people to realize what they're in for, so actually galvanizing support despite the few jobs that would come. Because the propaganda that the company would say is, oh, we're bringing jobs. Well, it's bad jobs. Mm. So um, we did actually help quite a lot of countries to wow. say no to planning permission. For, for quickly, so for some context, so if that's a vertically integrated farming system, what's the, what's the other option? What we would advocate is that they keep very, very firmly to their traditional way of farming, even if it's just the communist system, which has got these sheds that are large, but they're usually a diverse range of animals in them. They've got much more care from the local employment purposes and for the well-being of the animal but ideally we would say anybody who's still farming very traditionally with a mixed farm is far better way of farming to feed the world yeah. and increasingly the FAO the Food and Agriculture Organization which is part of the United Nations is saying that family farms are 100% the best way to feed the world of a growing population. Yeah. So we've got to undermine the myth that's been peddled by the corporations that we have to double production in factory farming systems to feed the world. That is yeah. untrue. I'm seeing so many threads emerge just in your conversation, just in that, what you spoke about just there, when it comes to like corporate takeover at the expense of the local people, um, when it comes to like health and well-being in comparison to kind of the economic well growth of like a company in a minority kind of 1% situation. And we are hearing so much like, oh, we're going to be 10 billion people in so many years. Like, how are we going to feed the world? It has to be coming like these mass agricultural systems um, that are ultimately owned by very few people. So then we're kind of at the, at the, at the feet of all of them. I'm wondering, like, was it this? What drew you into um, factory farming? Was it was it this, or was it um, was it something else? Like, what drew you into factory farming at, at first? I think because I so respect small scale family farms, partly because I think that it is a way for us to be happy. I think being a, connected to the land is a very genial way to be with your extended family and with a community. And I think that that way of living is very, very beautiful. And I, when I first got into the movement, I traveled a lot to see about traditional farms all over the world. And they were thriving in terms of happiness and well-being and self-sufficiency and food sovereignty, where they owned their own land. They knew that that land could feed them. So they were relaxed and they were happy and they weren't stressed. It's the moment you get the land grab of people coming in and saying, we're going to grow monocultures here, you can get a job. Well, the jobs are so few and far between, the pay is so appalling. For example, when I was in Kenya with my kids, I was just showing them traditional farming and the people were saying that their neighbors were drinking the pesticides because they just couldn't sustain their families. As a suicide. So they were su committing yeah. suicide. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, your dignity or everything is broken when you become dependent on a job, which is just a one-day contract, and it doesn't even pay you enough to sustain your family. And mm -hmm. the way that you used to grow on your own land, you'd grow a diversity of crops. Well, they say, you know, well, we, we pay them. Well, they could only afford to buy rice. And then you, they invent, you know... And why is rice... Why is GM rice, like golden rice. And they say, oh, well genetically engineer it to have more vitamins in it so that people stop getting blind. But it's like, no, people will stop getting blind if they could actually have a diversity of food that can sustain their health. This is so something that happened in India, though, isn't it? Yellow rice? Yes, golden rice. Golden rice? rice? Yes, genetically engineered. Could you explain a little bit about that for context, that specific example of golden rice? Well, basically... The corporate takeover of agriculture is that they want, the corporations want to give, they want to own the land, they want to um, control the inputs and own the seeds. So Monsanto, which is the biggest um, criminal at always producing poisonous products to kill, um, has got now 
this um, genetically engineered monopoly to actually being bought by Bayer, even though the shareholders are scandalized because there are so many people taking Monsanto to court because of their roundup, which is giving people um, cancer. And there are thousands of cases now pending and winning. So anyway, what we're seeing is the, the truth of this horrible genetically engineered corporate takeover, so-called advancement, where they come up with golden rice, which is supposed to help the people who are suffering in countries where they're depleted of their diversity of diet. So they're saying, well, we can solve it by giving you golden rice. So in that rice, we've genetically engineered something which was heavy in vitamins or something which will cure your, your blindness, your issues of um, nutritional deficiency. But that's the wrong way forward. That's the way they want you to go forward because they make the money. But the, re the really seriously good way forward is to give people their land. But how do they make the money? So a farmer has their normal rice seeds and they're growing rice. Then Monsanto comes and says, here is my seeds, yeah. buy my seeds. Like, how, what, what, why do they, why is that bad? Like, then they buy Monsanto seeds, but, but what happens to their land? It doesn't something, isn't it? Like, what's that step? Like, what, what, where's the, I feel like we're missing a piece here between yeah. like the buying of the Monsanto seeds and the farmer suicides that right. are happening. Like, what's the full story? Okay. Well, basically, it's land grab. But land grab, we all know, went on in colonial times, where we want their land to feed us in Britain. So we basically bankrupt our farmers with cheap imports. Well, a lot of these people that have given up their land are laborers on land. And that is those um, big farmers and increasingly smaller farmers are buying their seeds from Monsanto from seed companies and they're told that you're sick because you're not having um um uh, they know it's because they're not having a variety of food enough so they buy the rice for their own sustenance they don't grow it anymore they are laborers these people mm -hmm. and so they're very deficient and they're sick so Monsanto says, oh, we can solve that. So you go further down the technological road rather than back to a traditional, give their land back, let them grow diversity of fruit and vegetable and fiber. And they come up with a golden rice variety that they say is going to help them to stop losing their sight because they're so nutritionally deficient. So these are laborers. So basically what we're saying is don't subsidize that sort of progress. That progress is not actually helping people. It's only helping the corporations keep control of our farming industry. We want food sovereignty where people in all over the world, but particularly in third countries, because they are seriously being deprived of any variety or any enough money to buy a variety of diet for their children. So their children are so nutritionally deficient that they are suffering. So we don't want more GM and we don't want, apparently now they're making it illegal to buy traditional seeds. That you have to have a certain type of seed which is owned by the corporations. Yeah, that, this is quite an, um, a beautiful movement that's occurring in the resistance against against this, which is seed sovereignty, um, and I guess also food sovereignty, where people are saving their seeds now. Um, and I was listening to a beautiful podcast the other day about it, um, and about the kind of deep relationship you can have with your seeds and the, and the seeds that have been part of your community and fed your community for years. Um, could you explain a bit about um, seed sovereignty and, and food sovereignty? And land sovereignty. And land, yes. What does it? What does it? All, what does it all mean? Yeah. What does sovereignty mean? Well, it's different to security, in that food security, the government is saying, oh well, we're paying people enough money that they can buy their food, and we'll ensure that there is enough food for people to buy, and so we'll import it. We'll make sure they get it. What we're asking for is food sovereignty, where next door to you. And in your local farmer's control is the land. So people need access to land. They need to own that land or at least have seriously um, secure tenancies to that land so they can grow food for their family, for their local 
community and for wider the excess can go to the cities and then wider than that can be exported but always food and seed sovereignty so that they can develop their own and save their own seeds because it's very important apparently that seeds are local to an area because they've been developed through the families from generations to be very adapted to that soil and to that system and to that amount of water. Mm -hmm. So you can't have this sort of trading of monoculture seeds because anyway, it's actually much more prone to disease because if you've got just one strain and there is a disease, it just spreads like fire across the whole system of seeds yeah. same with animals and hence you then um need a lot more pesticides because um and there are patents on those seeds patents on the seeds mm. and then pesticides to work with those painted seeds which is why you get in that loop isn't it with monsanto with organizations like or corporations yeah. like monsanto um i was reading recently about soil erosion um and about how we have, was it 30 more harvests? Yes. Um, I think. And that is something terrifying. And, and that really links kind of climate change with um, factory farming and with pesticides. And, and the effect that we're having on the soil um, really kind of sum, I feel like sums up and brings together many um, many interrelated crises that we mm. see within the food system. Do Can you talk a little about the food, uh, soil erosion? Yes. I mean, I have I believe that when you are a, a small family, extended family, community that's all nurturing that enterprise where you can have more labor on the land, so you sh we should be taxing the inputs, especially the bad inputs, and not the labor, so that we can actually have integrated pro crop management, which means that you have certain crops that... Um, the insects don't like so they don't go to the next crop which is what you eat or then you can have another system which is that the insects love that one so they keep away from your crop that you want and it's like it needs to be diverse and it works as, as a diverse system mm. for example if you have pigs and you also have dairy and you take the milk from the cows and you make cheese and you have the leftover whey and you feed that to the pigs and the pigs um, root up the soil and it becomes perfectly um, manured from their feces to grow the next um, year you move them off and grow the feed for the animals and you can then rotate it to have vegetables and you can the whole system is a cyclical system and it traditionally works it mm. is quite labor intensive and we should stop thinking that farming is something to push the wages down of the the people and push the prices down of the food actually we used to pay more for our food and less mm. for our housing but yeah. now the banks have come you know and taken the price of the housing so excessively yeah. that it's like people think that food's got to be incredibly cheap because they don't have enough money yeah. i was in um tesco's actually <laughs> over christmas and i was disturbed because i was in the vegetable aisle um and they had these huge bags of carrots huge bags of potatoes and they were 14p or 17p and i just thought like oh how are we meant to be able yeah. to be connected with our farmers and with where our food is coming from when it when a Mars bar is like something so synthetic that mm. can, you know that can just be created from ke chemicals? I don't know. Is 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 so much more expensive than this huge bag of food that could sustain me for a week? I know it's crazy. And also, I've been thinking a lot about how England, like the the landscape of the United Kingdom, is so ideal for vegetable growing. And we're like a nation of farmers, like ancestrally a nation of farmers. And mm. um, and then all of the, a lot of the food now, when you walk down the aisle, not only does it come in plastic and millions of pa different types of packaging, but very, very little of it comes from within the United Kingdom, um, which is kind of shocking to think about all those extra miles that are involved in bringing carrots into the UK when the UK land is like ideal for carrots. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, the calculation has been done that says that you could feed the British people with their basic needs from the UK. 
the only thing we need to do is to reduce our meat intake. So, for example, I'm vegan, but I'm not vegan because I want to see the end of eating meat. I'm vegan because I had cancer and you have to alkaline your body. So that is a very important way to um, to kill, I think, my cancer went because of this, because I had it 10 years ago. Um, but I, in my campaign, Farms Not Factories, advocate that people eat less meat, but better quality meat. So therefore, they can spread the cost of the better quality meat by having less, but they also avoid Ill obesity related illnesses like diabetes, cancer and heart disease. So it I do actually think that it's important that people eat a small amount of meat because I think that we need the meadows and we need the um, feces from those animals. We need the system that that again is part of that that is a cycle that works and why if you've got literally millions if not a couple of billion people who are still small-scale agriculture, looking after their animals properly, fertilizing their soil, growing their crops. You can't just suddenly say, well, you've got to stop having meat because actually they don't eat much meat mm. and they eat a lot more vegetables. And actually, you know, it is possible if people want us all to go vegan. It probably is because actually places in India where people don't kill their dairy, they, they actually have the, the milk. And, you know, they worship the cow. So it's possible. So great. The more people who go vegan, the better. Vegetarian but sti be. still flexitarian would be good. Still, people who want to eat it, just make sure that you eat less but better. Because it's better for you. And it's definitely better not contributing so much to the greenhouse effect. Because it's, you know, the cows with the methane. And it just cannot be this factory farming system because that is totally unsustainable. Mm. You're getting so many animals in one place. They are on barren conditions with slats to get the feces to go through the slats and be taken out into a, a container where they can spread it on the land too close to the farm because the farm doesn't want to farmer doesn't want to take it miles and miles in its huge tractor so it over fertilizes areas near it and it eutrophies the river so all the fish die it's too much oxygen it kills the biodiversity the flora and fauna because there's too much ammonia there's too much nitrogen it's a, a serious problem ammonia and nitrogen are they used to what are they used for well, there, there's too much of them from factory farming. So it's okay if you have your few animals on your field. Is that from cleaning the pigs or ammonia is like a cleaning product, isn't it? Well, no, it's from the feces and the urine. It lets okay. out ammonia. So that's biodegrading feces and, and urine that's bringing up these chemicals. Um, so um, what we need to see really is are animals being cared for by our farming communities in a way which is sustainable because in those factory farm sheds the animals are so stressed because there's nowhere for them to root if you're looking at pigs. Rooting means you sniff around in the straw or the soil um, and so they're stressed. A stressed animal needs will get sick very quickly, especially if it's in a huge shed with lots of other animals that are stressed. So they give them antibiotics prophylactically, which means in their feed routinely. And that means that these um, sheds are breeding ground for antibiotic resistant bacteria, which not only um, spreads to the other animals, but it comes out of the sheds on the flies or the rats or the workers, and it spreads in the local community. So you have Campylobacter, you have um, Salmonella, E. coli, mm. and now MRSA, which is extremely, extremely dangerous, especially if you are a um, vulnerable person. So you can carry it and be perfectly healthy. But if you have a, a scar or a, a, a wound, or if you are, go and visit a hospital and all the people in there, you know, whether it's newborn babies or people with extremely compromised immune systems, they will get sick with MRSA. I mean, you know about MRSA in hospitals because it's 
the hospitals give their patients anyway too many antibiotics. So it's mutating itself into this MRSA. Mm. But if you're also getting it coming from factory farms, that is atrocious. Yeah. So Can we need to change from that system to get away from the cruelty, away from the antibiotic-resistant bacteria, and away from the pollution from putting so much mm. um, um, feces on the land. Yeah. And also away from all of the profits from those corporations that have had those factory farms goes into global money markets, not into um, local. the local community. But you've broken into a few fake factory farms, haven't you? Yeah. I mean, I suppose the one that kind of gets the most publicity is when I broke into a British factory farm. But, you know, I didn't reveal the name of the farmer or his brand because... To me, he's just another farmer who's been forced to break the law and cram his pigs into those sheds and sell them under a misleading name in the market. But how did you get in there? What did, can you, like, I watched the video, I think there's a clips of you doing yeah. your break in, in yeah. the middle of the night. Yeah, well, we had to wait until the farm workers had gone to bed. So, it's like being um, kind of a naughty, like <laughs> breaking into your school teacher's house in the middle of the night. Like, it's yeah. really scary. I, mean, I don't enjoy doing these things, but um, in a way, you know, visually, it's so atrocious what's going on in these farms. Did you jump the fence? Yeah, you, I just literally climbed over their barrier. I mean, a lot of them <laughs> I have tried to get in and I can't get in and I don't break in because that's illegal. <laughs> but if you can just walk in carefully. <laughs> but anyway, I went back for the third time and I got caught. Third, three times. Yeah. And um, because I was going to do it Facebook Live. And uh, he said, it's very lucky that I caught you because the boy's waiting at the farm. They're going to beat you up. They're absolutely furious. It's like, yeah. um, and he said, you know, you realize that I've been trying to, in the past, be um, RSPCA assured, but people aren't prepared to pay the extra money mm. to buy that. So I had to go back to this system. Yeah. So yes. we've really got to the point of our campaign is to get me more people to be aware of what to buy, yeah. where to buy it. Yeah. There's such a, such a there's such a tension, isn't there? Because, you know, increasingly the argument for veganism is becoming stronger and stronger. And like you said, you know, veganism is a, like an, an important piece. And and the more people that can be vegan, the better. In, cons in consideration for how many people are on the planet, and you know, and climate change and ecological um, devastation. At the same time, I think um, what I'm getting frustrated with at the moment is how in this set feeling of crisis and an emergency that we kind of just hold so tightly onto any um, kind of line of hope that we think we found, which is for a lot of people, the line of veganism, animal agriculture being the driving force of um, uh, biodiversity loss and, and carbon emissions. But it's just not, it's just so much more complex and nuanced than everyone becomes a vegan. And if you're not a vegan, you're a bad person. Because actually then you end up playing into the hands of, of globalized food systems and and away from localization, which whilst localization might not have the biggest carbon effect, environmentally it has a huge effect. Um, and I just think that, that, that we need to stop clinging so hard onto arguments just because things are overwhelming and confused like and confusing a lot of the time and think more about what what kind of like what is it that taking into consideration where where we are and what we can do at that time in that place and how we can support a deeper systemic change rather than kind of judging everyone else all the time because I see a lot of stuff on Facebook about anyone who's not a vegan is basically a terrible person and that's just that's not a fair line of argument um and it also you know and then and then for example during Extinction Rebellion um in October uh, there was a segment animal rebellion, which I completely agree with with the values of it. But they went to the um, Smithfield. to Smith. What's it called? Smithfield. Smithfield meat market, and were there for the week. And there was a part of me that felt like, you know, poor butchers <laughs> and farmers, because 
it's not it's not their fault it's mm. it, i mean yeah like, yes they're they're part of the system but actually like i'm not anti eating meat i'm anti the way meat is produced and i'm anti how much meat is produced and i'm anti the way meat is marketed to be and so how cheap and cut off we are from the meat yeah like, how cut off we are from the fact that that was a living animal and we're eating if we eat factory farm meat a living animal that was highly abused highly stressed yeah that traumatized traumatized and and also you know in in london you don't you know you have so there's a lot more options it's not just, it's not like you you're just eating the meat from the next door farm type of thing. Um, but like whilst I'm saying all of this, I'm also aware that, you know, the position I'm in of like privilege and being able to have lots of choices and, um, and it's, you know, it's important to like acknowledge that. But what I love about the work that fact, Farms Not Factories does is t- trying to kind of democratize what healthy eating is and show that it doesn't need to be really, really expensive to eat, um, eat better higher quality meat can you can you explain a bit about yeah, the that? labeling that'd be great yeah presently we have a campaign which we're launching uh, as we speak called pigs in chains and that's basically a part of our series that is um started with a uh, celebrity led turn your nose up at pig factories and then we did um rooting for real farms with chefs and then we did a film in Northern Ireland and it was led by Jerome Flynn from um, Game of Thrones. And this Pigs in Chains series is that we went to the AGM of five big high street companies, Greggs, Domino's, Sainsbury's, Morrison's and Tesco's. And we bought a share in their company so that we could go to the shareholder meeting and say, we're worried about the value of our shares. We had one. Um, <laughs> because share. you are still selling factory farm meat. And people are going vegan and vegetarian because they're disgusted by that factory farming system. So why do you continue? And we also say that actually the government is mitigating some of the problems from factory farms, like a law has come in through the EU to ban the prophylactic giving of antibiotics. That means the regular in the feed um, giving of antibiotics. They want it to be metaphylactic, which means that if there's an individual animal that's sick, then that animal can be treated, but just not routinely. And that comes in in 2022. So why are you still selling factory farming? Why aren't you buying from this, you know, and encouraging more smaller scale mm. happy pig farms? And one more thing, there was a really amazing man who was a hedge funder called Jeremy Collar, and he nearly died. And his friend said, "Well, if you live, you know, what would you do to the for the world?" He said, "I'll close factory farming," <laughs> and he lived. And he now controls twenty trillion dollars worth of he's got a sort of consortium of investors who are very aware of his company called farm animal investment risk and return and they're increasingly saying that they're not going to invest in factory farming so why are you still selling factory farm meat and then after we did that we filmed our standing outside their shops and speak to their customers and when we show them what the conditions of the meat that they're selling they go oh my god I didn't realize that that was still legal and they say well I'd have thought that Domino's for example is a very wealthy company it certainly charges a lot for its pizza why <laughs> can't it have you know a vegan option on the top that tastes like meat there's lots of that around to give us the choice and Greg's has actually got the vegan option but the rest of the pork is still from factory farms yeah. Yeah. that's what really annoys me actually is this vegan option which so many places offer but it's a vegan option or it's factory farming probably even worse than they were doing before because now they feel they can get away with it because they've got the <laughs> vegan option mm. and it's just so it's so frustrating mm. yeah. um, what, what, well I just would love to get on to another part which is that the farmers with Brexit will continue to get their three billion, which is a subsidy for them basically to compete with cheap imports flooding in from the EU. But now that we've left, Boris might do a deal with America and other countries that have even cheaper, even lower standards. 
So all of those people who voted Brexit that wanted to be able to say no to imports, which would be illegal to produce in this country because our standards are, ha are higher, we might be going down an even m more dangerous road yeah. of, of a lower so standards. Crazy. So what I'm thinking is, sorry, I've kind of lost my little thread there. Hang on, mm -hmm. I'm just going to get back to it, but I will get to it. Um, oh, yes. Um, so I think it's incredibly important that not only do we get a Brexit which actually enables our, our farmers to raise their standards, but I would like to see a stop to this six billion I found out is going into novel foods. Novel foods includes nano foods, GM What's foods. What's a nano food, sorry? Tech food. It's high tech food. It's really. Lab grown. Yeah, it's not made with natural ingredients. It's seriously dissected into a tiny nano is a tiny, tiny, tiny particle, which really doesn't have very much relation to what it was like when it was a, an entire um, product, because our bodies are used to the entire product. And if you just got one tiny bit of it, that doesn't actually have the same effect on us. But anyway, nano food, GM food, Petri dish food is getting twice the amount of money that our farmers are getting in this country to produce food which is from and with their public money for public goods which is good rather than the old common agricultural policy EU system which was just your area payment so big farmers got the most money we are seeing our government what pushing us away from what they say they're going to do which is encourage more natural farming where you protect the soil where you make sure that mm. there is biodiversity now i just i'm really worried and the other thing is that the tories focused on labeling which is great we do need to have not only labeling of the good but we need to have labeling that says this is from a factory farm this is how this has been produced we need to have something where it's got a sort of app that you put it into the um label with the price which says exactly what the farm was like so yes you can have the choice but people wouldn't buy from a factory farm they'd buy from the happy pig farm that's why they're really not doing it we're worried in the food movement that that interest in labeling is because although the government has said that they're not going to undermine our food standards in their trade treaties we believe that last minute they'll say i'm terribly sorry but we couldn't because we were saving the jobs for our cars because we need to keep importing them but there is a label on the chlorinated chicken coming in from america the hormone injected beef coming in from america and the pork which was being injected with ractopamine which makes the pig grow 18 percent oh faster it's, it's a beta agonist so these pigs are unbelievably stressed so as i said before they're already stressed when there's barren conditions in these factory farms in america the conditions are diabolical they are their entire life in the mothers in a cage they can't turn around in and during their pregnancy it's been banned in the eu so they're only allowed to have it for one month of the three months three weeks three days of their pregnancy in britain it's entirely banned in the three months three weeks three days of their pregnancy you're only allowed to have it in that cage that she can't turn around at all when she's feeding her babies and that's why and that would be called uk normal standards and red tractor but what we're saying is please don't buy Red Tractor. It's not good enough. That mummy is still in the cage when she's feeding her babies. You need to buy RSPCA assured, free range or organic. Can I ask the, the, about the difference between um, free range and organic? Because on sometimes you see things saying free range, sometimes organic. And it's quite hard to find things that are free range and organic at the same time. Well, because there wouldn't be any point in putting that label on. The, the free range is basically, it's the guarantee of the seller that that has always been outside and has been treated naturally. Um, they haven't, however, got the conditions of the feed, which is quite strong in the organic system, that it's not just full of um, grains. It's got to have more nutritious feed. But the organic is somebody from the organic um, certification 
system has gone and checked that you have kept up with the rules. So it's an independent label okay. from the seller. So, you know, if a big company is saying it's free range, you, you're trusting them. Okay. It's certainly better than RSPCA should, and it's certainly be better than any of the others, which right. has, in other words, just an So EU. Red Tractor is nothing, really. Red it's Tractor just, is better than... It's still than, a cage. It's still drugs. It's better than EU. It's better than American, if we're going to get that. It's better than Australian. It's better than any of the others because it's British, but it's not good enough. Don't buy it. You know what I find so shocking is the fact that we might, in the UK, have high standards yet we're able to import from places that don't have those high standards how is that possible or consistent with our ethics well i think that that's why so many farmers actually voted to come out of europe because they don't they want to be able to say no to all the products that are flooding into our markets that are not produced to a standard yeah. that we yeah. enforce here and that would be illegal yeah. if we practice that sort of system here so that is how we should remain a barrier and actually michael gove said he would have tariffs write to your member of parliament here's the letter it's very easy you just press a button that says to your government please don't allow any imports to come into this country which would be illegal to produce in this mm. country i think brexit was just one massive scam headed by government and corporations so that they could have complete unregulated free trade with all of these countries well it's not what a lot of people voted for brexit they wanted more control yeah. and that was the promise do you mean people within the uk wanted more control well, they, they were the ones who voted Brexit yeah, yeah. because they didn't want to have their markets constantly flooded with produce which was illegal to produce here. I mean, you've seen the undermining of the farming system from the EU in this country where it's now just full of giant factory farms, giant monoculture farms, monoculture seeds, more and more pesticides and chemicals. The common, the common agriculture policy seriously never worked it was just total devastation for farmers that was giving fishermen. the biggest farmers the most money yes okay. wow. and encouraging people to go bankrupt and be bought up by ever bigger so every farmer would you know think oh i'm okay i'm still surviving and then somebody you know the, the economy would again cheaper coming in and he would go bankrupt too. You can't compete when there's cheaper coming in. We need to protect our farmers. Yeah. Yeah. We're an island. So how? So we have the labels. Are there any other um, practical steps that people can take in order to ensure that they're supporting a more regenerative um, food system? I think that they can remain very aware that their own body needs nutritious food and the sort of factory farmed food, monoculture food, heavy chemical food is not actually giving them, them the nutrition that they need. And it's too expensive to buy supplements. You really need to follow on the internet um, advice of what sort of diverse diet to eat and how the label should look for you to know that that food has the nutrition you need. Mm. And largely it's going to be organic because organic has the soil that brings in the trace elements into that product that you get the sustenance. Mm. And your body will not be overweight because it's not just filling itself with sugar and nutritionally de deficient food. You need to take exercise as well, obviously. But your diet is essential. And in those choices you will see that uh, organic farming is much smaller scale. It's much more uh, rotating the system of growing. And better still, you get it from local producers. So that doesn't mean that you have to live in the middle of the countryside. You can look on the internet and you can get a box of organic vegetables delivered to your door at a really competitive price. If you go to Farm Drop, and you've got to be aware that if it is slightly more expensive than the bottom range of the supermarket, you are actually sustaining the soil for your children to be able to survive on this planet. Yeah. So it's worth it. It's worth it for your health and less visits to the doctor, but it's also wealthy, uh, 
worth it for the health of your children and the health of your children and your children's children. So the fact that you get cheap food, it shouldn't really be the fact that you can't afford that more expensive food. It's that the system is undermining you getting a decent wage. And we've got to look after our health, our family's health, our community's health, our region's health, our nation's health. And that's called food sovereignty. We need to allow more people onto the land to learn about growing horticulture. I went to this conference the other day where I told you it's the subsidy is six billion into novel foods. And actually the meeting was being chaired by the former head of the Green Party. And she was the only voice who said, actually, the novel foods for people in this country needs to be vegetables. (laughs) (laughs) People are not eating enough vegetables, but growing it sustainably, looking after the soil. Yeah, wow. And also the the less transport, if you sell it as locally as possible. Yeah, we're so cut off though, aren't we? It's like when you go into the supermarket and you buy your sausage in plastic, you're so cut off from seeing the whole big picture of where that's come from and the story behind it. And as soon as we know those things, it's like the cost isn't just 14 pence. It's 14 pence plus an environmental cost that's just catastrophic. And a human rights cost And a human rights cost. Yeah. Well, there was a very good paper done by the Sustainable Food Trust called... um, the true cost of food. And it's basically saying that for every pound you spend at the retail till, another pound has been spent in terms of subsidies or your health, so more national health bills. So you've got to realize that this system that we're propping up is unsustainable because it's got so many external costs i.e. costs outside of what you actually pay mm. at the till. Mm. And we've got to stop those those costs because we're still paying it with our health and with our taxes. Yeah. So we've got to ensure that we are represented by politicians that understand that local food, that sustainably produced food, needs to be at the centre yeah. of our agricultural uh, policy. And when we th- go, to quickly go back to about the cost of, of um, organic food... The, I think a major issue is the fact that that cost is the burden of the consumer mm. and it needs to be the governments that are subsidizing it and subsidizing better food that's better for the people and better for the land. Mm. That's where the subsidies, I, I, well, yeah. after this, I should, I so believe crazy. are going into because because now what we have is this kind of, kind of healthy wellness world, which is actually just not accessible for the majority. And instead, and, and so people think that to ha- be, have a vegan or, or plant rich diet, you kind of need to be going to Whole Foods and buying things like maca and spirulina and wheatgrass and and artichoke hearts and like all these things that are just really expensive um and actually well a you can simplify your diet and have a really like delicious plant-rich diet by learning how to actually use you know things like lentils and and rice you know things that don't have a huge um, carbon input but you can make really tasty But at the same time, it's really we need to be campaigning for our governments to be subsidizing those choices because it can't be a choice that you can that for only the people. Okay, so as an example, (laughs) for example, um, yeah, I I can't remember my train of thought. (laughs) Yeah, no, I think it's incredibly important that whole farm agroecology goes into the agriculture bill. By that, I mean people who have small holdings with a complete range of production systems that are cyclical within their own um, ability to take up all of the excess. So presently, we've got 33% of our food is wasted. It's binned, whether it's from the household or the supermarket or the restaurant or from the system of of the land because it's not the right shape for the supermarket shelf. So we need to have a system which is far more growing locally, consuming all of that product, all of the food. You certainly don't trust the um, sell-by date. You can go way over that sell-by date, but you actually could... I mean, I never throw any away. I'm vegan. It just... 
you know, it doesn't go off. It certainly doesn't harm me. There shouldn't be any waste in the household. And we should forbid supermarkets for having any waste. All of it should be going either to a, 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 an area which is cut, cut price, rather than in its bin where people have to go and scrounge from the bin. It's outrageous. Most of the time you can't even scrounge it. It's There's double-barreled locks on it. <laughs> yeah, but that's just complete greed. But the government could be more representing human needs and planetary needs, but they tend to be far more interested in growth and corporate profits competing with businesses abroad. Yeah. We've got to stop. We've got to have compassion, cooperation, community, not competition. And, you know, this downward spiral of cutthroat businesses. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's why technology, technological foods are being invested in. It's because it's a way to have control and to make more profit. Really. Yeah, it's more control from big business. Yeah. We need to go in the opposite direction. We need to go back to the land. And we can do it. It's on the internet. We need to buy these boxes or get involved in a community support in agriculture, take your children down and help with the growing. Volunteering on a farm. Yeah. I think that there actually should be, um, during the holidays or during a period of children's life, it should be like six months on a farm. Now, those farms can't be with giant tractors and incredibly complicated chemicals because there's nothing really you can do to help because you need to be highly technically skilled. But there are farms still out there that are small scale. Agroecology and whole farm agroecology is really what we need to be looking at. Mm. So it's small scale and it's family run and there's, you can help with making the cheese, you can help with picking the vegetables, you can help with growing the vegetables, you can start to understand how you can pick the leaves from the hedges and take them over to the sheep. You know, there's, there's so many traditional ways of looking after our animals that we've abandoned because we've been taught by corporations through Farmers Weekly that's being completely subsidized by the corporations who want you to buy all the inputs yeah. from them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And connecting, reconnecting to na reconnecting to the land, to our food system is yes. like a, a sure way for reconnecting communities and therefore happiness as well. Yes. Mm. And I mean, I'm, I find being a vegan quite useful because if those um, very, very um, dogmatic veganists say, oh, well, you've got farms, not factories, you're obviously still killing animals. And it's like, well, actually, I am a vegan. But I still do believe that we do need some animals that are looked after properly to have the meadows, to have the diversity of insects that come from breaking down the feces and on those meadowlands. And human beings are unfortunately very, very selfish. So unless you have a reason to have that land in that way, they are going to do something to make some money. It's all about you know, profit. So if you could make it that there is profit in more sustainable farming systems and on a small scale, whole farm agroecology, stop this monocultures, even if it's organic, we shouldn't have these giant monocultures. It's got to be more diverse, more fruits and veg and crops and diverse animals and diverse markets and, you know, rebuild it empower the farmer that way so he's not always having the prices pushed down by the supermarket because everybody's providing the same product mm -hmm. and actually even when we had the supermarkets got together and said okay we will pay a basic price for the milk they were sued by the monopolies and mergers commission for coming forming a cartel to dictate the price of milk and it's like whoa you can't win in any way wow. we do need to pay more for products so that we have a fair price to our farmers who grow our food. We'll starve if we don't have farmers. Mm. But we need real farmers, not intensive industry. Yeah. That's for cars. Just for cars. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, yeah, Tracy. You, Tracy. That was okay. very, very educational. Wow. Yeah. I feel like it would be good just to close to say a couple of things that ways you can buy food so we'd like to summarize we've done the labeling in within supermarkets so it's free range organic rspca assured yeah then there's obviously 
markets and farmers markets right. where you can talk to the people who you're buying your food from to find out about it. And then you mentioned online, there are farm drop. Yes, and, and Big Barn. Big Barn, is that another <laughs> online? Yes. Big Barn. Um, Trying to grow your own food. Growing your own food. Getting involved in community-supported agriculture projects, which is where you volunteer on farms. There's cool um, stuff like Incredible Edible about these urban farms popping up. Um, like uh, actual actual like garden farms, yeah. not, not um, city farms. Eating as much organic vegetables as possible where that are from local areas or from within the UK without big imports mm. and if you are going to occasionally eat meat making sure that it's from a happy farm happy pigs if that's possible yeah that's that that will cause some will <laughs> eyebrow <laughs> raises because <laughs> some people say there's no such, there's thing. No such but, thing but but yeah if if you eat meat being or as, dairy or dairy being as ethical as definitely so pasture fed meat pasture fed mm. beef yeah they've had a good life wandering yeah, around once. in the meadows. I, I think the um <laughs> I think the the other thing is is kind of reigniting a curiosity about where your food comes from and what's happening with the, you know within the food system and and engaging with that if if you live in 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 this in a place where you really can't get hold of organic food um and or it's so expensive uh, maybe ask why what's going on write to your MPs write to your governments write to the shops around you talk to your community because um, that's unacceptable um, and yeah yeah. I think with our culture and, and way of living a lot of people have very little meaning in their life because they're making a product or answering the phone that's just meaningless and destructive to the planet And a lot of people get happier by having a project which is about helping themselves and helping local people and so if you could you know form groups and watch films and read books and find out about local food and support your local farmer and buy it from places like Riverford or um, Big Barn or there's so many enterprises out there that are British real farmers where they're giving their animals a really decent life and they're growing plants that are really nutritious because they're on organic soil that is being regenerated rather than the sort of soil which is covered in fertilizer, which just loses its ability and its connection to the plant altogether. Mm. And so it's like feeding a kid constantly with sugar. It's going to grow up extremely weak. So it encourages disease and with the... Um, with the crops, it encourages f funguses and um, all sorts of pests. So you need pesticides as well as the fertilizer. That whole system has to go. But we can make it our project. We can do it as human beings and enjoy the choices and help each other to find out. And it's a revolution. And it's mm. fun. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Tracy, so much. Brilliant. Thank yeah. you. So everyone needs to go to www.farmsnotfactory.org. Yeah. Brilliant, thank you. And write to your MPs. Thank you. <laughs>